So here we are alongside the Merritt Parkway and there's a building and there's the Connecticut Yankee Council Incorporated Boy Scouts of America. And we'll go around this way and go into the office. These are some medals that Eric Johnson, one of our benefactors, uh, donated to the museum. Eric was a very active scouter and uh, collected, or actually received many of these awards because of his international scouting activities. Eric donated virtually all of the books in our library. He, he had a tremendous collection and was actually planning on his own museum before he uh, passed away. We have some of the very early handbooks going right back to the 1910 edition. We have a lot of scout fiction. We have a set of the uh, scout handbooks in Braille for blind scouts. And we have Cub Scout books. There's the uh, label here. We'll yes, uh, Bill Janega, a scout master, in fact, Gordon Beach, a scout master from 177 in Stratford, uh, was the a carpenter and built the shelves for us uh, before he passed. In fact, I think you mentioned that they were working on some yes. of this stuff. Yes. Yeah. I know. Hi. Uh, just moving around the museum. We have some of the early posters. This was from World War I. You know, the, for the scouts encouraged people to buy bonds for the war. This was a, a, a cavalcade of scouting. In each of the cabinets, we have memorabilia do, devoted to one of the councils that predece our predecessors to Connecticut Yankee. This is the Connecticut, Yank Connecticut uh, Central Connecticut Council. Uh, camp Terramagus was the early camp. Later became Deer Lake, which is currently owned by Connecticut Yankee Council. Up here we have activity patches from, uh, the, again, the, all the councils that make up Connecticut Yankee Council. And we're always looking for more donations. If anybody has any activity patches, that might not be on our display. That's sorted by council. Uh, this is Quinnipiac Council here. And most of the uh, patches have been donated by members of the museum, but we are always looking for more. And these are the years? Uh, like uh, no, these are the pages. Well, just the pages. Right. Now, moving around here, this is Camp Sequasset. Uh, from uh, Quinnipiac Council and currently Connecticut Yankee Council. We have some very early patches going right back into the probably the 1920s. And this is uh, one of the first issues of uh, Camp Sequasset. And we have some certificates that go back to uh, 1940, 1936. That's when I was born. Oh, then <laughs> it's not so old, actually. Then <laughs> this is an early uh, uniform from Stanford, Connecticut. That it has a World Jamboree patch, uh, 1929. Moving ahead, this is Alfred Dater Council. Uh, this is the Silver Buffalo Award certificate that Alfred Dater received in 1932. It's a beautiful document on a uh, beautiful parchment. That's the level higher than the Silver Beaver. Correct. The Silver Beaver is the highest honor that a council can devote to give to a scouter. This is what the national will give. Yeah, these are patches from Ponus Lodge, which was the lodge from Alfred Dater Council. Some early Camp Toquam patches in the back. Uh, this is actually the one of the early ch uh, council charters of actually Stanford Council, which preceded Alfred Dater Council. Uh, this is 1920. Uh, this was donated by a very good friend of mine, uh, Attorney Robin Cutts from Virginia. And James West, a very yes. famous name there. Yeah. Indeed. 
Yeah, I know for. Yes, and there's Dan Beards, the national commissioner. Yeah. Now here we have some more activity patches. Now this is from Connecticut Yankee Council. As we say, activity patches bring memories into focus. Very good point, Harvey. As a matter of fact, this is one of the most popular exhibits that we have. Everybody wants to look back and say, oh yes, I went to that event, or I have that patch. And uh, could you give us a little background? When is the museum open and uh, sure. where is it located again? Yes, the museum is located at 60 Wellington Road, Milford, which is the Connecticut Yankee Council headquarters. We're open every Saturday from 10 o'clock to 2, 10 o'clock in the morning to 2 p.m. in the afternoon. And if there's a group that would like to come and see it, we can probably arrange you know, a special opening. And they could contact me, Bob Sherman, at footdoc7777 at gmail.com. And we'll be happy to arrange that for you. And they can contact the office, too, I'm they, assuming. Yeah. Uh, they can, but they'll probably refer you to okay, uh, refer them to me. And just moving along, this is Maui Hill Council. So what have you done in uh, the Norwalk area? Uh, uh, some of the early camp uh, Maui Hoop patches. Yeah, I went to uh, their camp one summer, too, as a scouter. Oh, is that right? Uh, a scout, I should say. I wasn't a scouter yet, yes. Okay. Before, I think, Camp uh, Pomperog had closed, and they were building the new Pomperog and Union. So that was that little hiatus between the two. Exactly right. There. Yeah. The, the first Camp Pomperog, uh, the Exor, uh, closed in 1948 when they had a fire, I think, in the dining room, or a storm destroyed it. So there was a few years where uh, Maui who welcomed the scouters from Pomperog Council. Good, that's, a, that's a good memory. Some of the history, yes. Indeed. And Camp Pomperog opened in the early 50s, I believe. Yep. Uh, and there's some uh, pendants on the wall from uh, Camp Pomperog and Camp Maui Hu. As of right now, we only have two books that are registered under... I remember this one, because that's when I went to Camp Pomperog. That's the pendant that I got. Yeah. <laughs> there's the uh, famous patch there, too. Indeed. In fact, speaking of the famous patch, it's right over here. Oh, yeah. That's the one that we gave out for years. Camp Lodge, 408. I was a member of that. No, I, I know you were. These are some very early Camp Pomperog patches, They're made out of felt. That's before my time, yeah, I think. We well, did. yes, my time, too. You remember that big white neckerchief from 408? No, oh, it's yes. a supersized. Yeah, that's the first step. Now, these are some, uh, this is the Mackenzie uh, statue. The original is in Philadelphia. And actually, th these were my father's. I have uh, one myself. Is that right? 1951, yeah. Yeah, it's a classic I got design. Mine, though, yeah. yeah the, the one he received when he was council president and one when he was a scoutmaster. There's a little something we can include in there. Oh, right here. Um, bro, yeah. Okay. And this is the Pinewood Derby display. The Pinewood Derby are model cars that Cub Scouts build with their fathers. That's always a key element. The father can't build it himself. He has to have the boy help build it. And of course, some of them are really quite creative. This is a, a taco car. Okay. <laughs> There's a Hartford Whalers car from the hockey team. Uh, there's a ghost rider. It looks like a skeleton in a coffin, uh, into a made into a car. Oh yeah. So this so is were a, these necessarily winners or just? Uh, yeah, I think just creative. Uh, I I don't know if they were winners or not, very frankly. But they were creative. Exactly. <laughs> I know when I made uh, a Pinewood Derby car with my son. We I think we were with the slowest car every year. No matter what we did, we could never get it to go faster. But he enjoyed it. <laughs> I remember one of my uh, son's trials. The uh, car went off the track. Then he didn't get to the finish. <laughs> it, it happens. <laughs> it happens. But it was a good uh, good time had by all. Anyway. Well, that that's the key element. It's a good father-son time. 
if Joe Gargiulo is our expert in uh, Piva Derby, and many of these cards are from his collection, uh, he has up in the corner there. This the Don Murphy is actually a friend of was a friend of Joe's, and he's the one who started Piva Derby out in California in 1953. Then they had the Rocket Derby too, a little bit. Of, oh, I, I don't remember that. Uh -huh. I mean, instead of cars, they put them on wires and then a little jet thing and. Oh, well, no, it was a propeller type of thing. I, I'm not sure what they called it. I don't think it was a Pinewood Derby, but uh, there was some kind of Pinewood involved oh, in it, yes. Very good. Uh, ...display in the museum. This is the uh, Indian costume from Chief Paparog Lodge going back into the 1950s and 60s. The reason why this is very special is that when I was Lodge Chief of Chief Paparog Lodge, this is the outfit that I wore at the Indian ceremonies. Ali Watsakima is the chief of the fire. Uh, it's made out of um, suede, and these are some of the very early Camp Pomperog patches. Uh, this is a beaded vigil uh, order of the arrow sash. And if Harvey can get around the side, you can see the beautiful headdress that uh, the chief wore. We were very pleased when this was donated back to the museum. Down here we have some early posters from the 1937 and 35 National Jamborees. This was the first National Jamboree that actually had to be canceled because of a polio epidemic. epidemic. So instead of having it in 35, they held it in 1937. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you. Now here are some patches from the Fairfield County Council, again one of the predecessor councils to uh, Connecticut Yankee Council. They had a number of uh, patches showing uh, the famous chiefs of uh, uh, Native Americans. Now this is an early Cub Scout uniform from the 50s. Uh, this actually was my uniform. Ooh. I find I can't fit into it anymore, so I did donate it to the museum. <laughs> and lots of arrow points there. Yeah, we had right? a few. Yeah, yeah. And the, the cubbery cub was a, a Whoa, yearly event you know, yeah. where all the Cub Scout packs got together in Longbrook this is Park. This program here of uh, all of the uh, booklet. Now, this is a display uh, down here. Is that Troop 50? It, it is Troop 50. I believe Troop 50. That's my old... Uh, Predecessor to Troop 52 from St. Stephen's. Yeah. No kidding. I think so. Yeah. Well, if you notice the material, it's yeah. like a very heavy wool. I can't imagine wearing that in the summertime, but yeah. scouts did. And those are Camp Pomperog patches. Mm -hmm. That was the Beaver Award, which was earned at camp, and one of the early uh, Pomperog arrows. Troop 50 here. Yeah. There we go. Troop 50 Bridgeport. Yeah, I think that was St. Stephen's the predecessor to Troop 52. Very very good. Now down here we have an interesting display. Years ago, scouts used to wear a little strip on their left sleeve that indicated the town that they, uh, their troop was located. The earlier ones were red and khaki and red and tan. And these are the different towns that make up Connecticut Yankee Council. Yeah. Yeah, the the yellow and dark blue is were Cub Scout. The uh, red and whites were more common. That was back more in the 50s and 60s. These are before uh, shoulder patches. CSPs developed. And these are a few from Kentucky yeah, Council. Did you did the Lego Derby with Lenny? No, we didn't. Okay, what he does there. This is an old uniform from Camp Tok Tokwam of the Alfred Dater Council. And again, it's out of the old material. There's some merit badges, and the square shaped. And the, uh, the protocol for that, as I recall, is if you had like six merit badges, you wore them on your sleeve, mm -hmm. and then after that, you would get the sash. Right. Apparently, this yeah. fellow didn't get a sash until he had eight. Until he had but, but, that, but that's the right idea. Yeah, that was, uh, was something like that. Yeah. yeah. Now, these are our Coon Lodge patches, Order of the Arrow. 
going back to the early felts and moving up to the more uh, current uh, patches until the merger. This is Steve. Steve Grove was a very active Quinnipiac scouter. I mean, his widow donated uh, many of his memorabilia. <laughs> and finally, uh, uh, back here we have uh, a Sea Scout uniform from 1943. Uh, Bill Amadon, one of the professionals here, uh, donated his father's uniform. Study this and tell us what's wrong with that. See what's wrong with that trophy. Ooh, I think and that's a picture of a sea, uh, not necessarily the same uh, ship, but it's of the same vintage. And this is uh, basically our miscellaneous display. We change this periodically. Uh, we have some Rockwell medals and plates, some very early Boy Scout, Boy's Life magazines, 1925. A Lone Scout was a organization of scouts that were kind of in a rural area where they weren't close enough to actually join a troop so they could do it, be scouts on their own. And this is 1925 Boys Life. Still a very good magazine. I had Absolutely. ordered it for my grandson. Absolutely. So basically that's a little survey of our museum. We certainly would encourage Visitors every Saturday morning from 10 to 2. If you have any questions, please contact anybody associated with the museum, and we'd be happy to talk to you. Thank you very much, Harvey. Okay, this is a walk around the scouting store that they have. So we'll just take a little walk around and see what's available. In case you've never been here and may be interested in getting something. Lots of camping equipment, things relating to scouting, booklets. Fitting room, and of course, current patches for leaders. Merit badge uh, items, and of course, uniforms of various types. Neckerchiefs, slides. Socks, even. Of course, hats, sweatshirts, t-shirts. Pinewood Derby items. Stickers. Those didn't take off, I'm sorry. Even some clearance items. No, CO2 cartridge. Yeah. You got a starting block. Yeah. Yeah. So they came out with it a few years ago for the Decals, emblems. And of course, friendly service to meet your needs. Right.